Nine photos you should always have on your phone. This is the focus group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's the focus group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John Nash, waving to you <laughs> out there in TV land, broadcast land, video land, webcast land, whatever you call it. What do you call this, John? The flat video screen game? land. Yeah. Flat screen <laughs> land. Yeah. Or for the majority of you, which is 99.9% .9 of you, which just listen to audio, welcome as well. So uh, thanks for uh, for joining us this week. And uh, be sure to catch our Tuesday podcast, which you'll also find at focusgroupradio.com. All of our media is housed there. And, of course, our live streams at YouTube as well as at Facebook uh, stream as well. Or anywhere you can find. Somebody asked me where to find us. I said basically anywhere where you don't have to pay. You pretty much <laughs> find us. Or just Google. Google Focus Group Radio and uh, or John's name and my name with Focus Group. And you'll we'll pop up somewhere with either our podcast or our focus group radio show now in our 14th or 15th year. I don't know. However you mark it. 14th is if I mark it that way. And, uh, wanted to mention also that later on, we're gonna have a deep discount read. It's Halloween sale. And I have to just tell you that Tim always surprises. I do like what you pick. And, uh, what, before we got on the air, Tim and I were talking a bit about how sometimes our time is not our own. You know, Tim has a list of chores to do, but now that he is an elected official, every little problem, <laughs> becomes your problem right you know and i'm in a slightly similar uh role being i'm on my co-op board which is volunteer as well but you do get um it's almost as if you're the new dog catcher right you know i got a dog down the road that's a problem could you please take care of it no that's not really well you're you're elected <laughs> well we had someone stop by we were on our way to dinner uh richard and i with some some friends we were taking them out for dinner and a uh, woman pulls up and starts drilling me about uh, an issue in town. And uh, I said, we're, we're on our way out to dinner. I said, could you please send me an email or contact me during the week? This was a Saturday. And just kept full steam ahead. And I said, we are late for dinner. And, and uh, Richard was getting aggravated. The two people in the back seat, the two women were getting aggravated. And uh, they're like, my, oh, my. And I said, yeah. I said, this is... Uh, I remember Mr. and Mrs. Candido saying, this is why, I always wondered why they never ate out in town or didn't go out in town. And Marianne said the same thing. <laughs> and um, so we actually did pick a kind of an obscure restaurant in town to go to for that very reason. So we walk in there and one of the women says, do you know anybody in here? Is anybody in here you recognize? So uh, we could uh, have dinner in peace sort of thing. But it comes it, it with the territory. Comes with the territory. And I'm so glad you brought up our uh, Marianne's mom and dad. We love them to death. And... Uh, you know, the whole family and what we learned from that family. Um, it's just phenomenal in terms of, uh, Mr. C used to be the, I guess it was the mayor. We called the select movement. He was the town mayor and we'd hear these stories, but now that we were in these roles, yeah. yeah, I was walking down the sidewalk the other day. I was, uh, halfway back from the train and I, a resident of our building sees me and says, I need to speak to you about something. I'm like, what they said, you know, they're, <laughs> they're cutting down a tree in front of the building and it's going to take down a bird's nest that I really like. I like looking at that bird's nest every day. And I said, well, I think the tree you're mentioning is actually dead. Well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I like I said, that bird's nest. I said, it does matter. It's dead. It, it could hurt if some th something falls or something. Get to see the guy that's cutting it down. And I said, you know, I had, yeah, yeah. He, I said, I, I just heard from someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've already gotten the ear full. Tree's coming down. So, and I, I like that. And, and one of our board members, when I first joined the board, we would have these discussions about things. And I was very surprised by how quickly many of the board members would just be like, we're not doing that. That's done off the table. Not, not even a thing of discussion. After a year and a half, almost two years, you learn quickly that there are some things that you just aren't going to deal with. And, you know, that people have to understand that. And, and it's, it's just one of those things. You're going to get that that way, too. It's like, you know, no, that's not my problem. I got to go. I'm going up there. So how long are you on this, this co-op board? For? I'm elected every year. Um, I was appointed it, right literally before lockdown, um, I was appointed. It was the last time I saw the boardroom, the physical boardroom, and then we went virtual. And then I was reelected. I was actually elected when we had our last election. And uh, and I think that um, 
you know, as long as I enjoy doing it, which I do enjoy, um, I'll, I'll do it. But I think the time differences are very, like I have an hour long, two hours once a month, plus a couple of things in between. And I have to monitor and, you know, manage the job, the projects that I'm doing, like we're doing, redoing the lobby and putting new doors in. And I took that one over because being an uh, art director, I could much more easily speak about it, about color, about, you know, the whole thing and present it differently than, or I think better than it might've been. But yeah, it's, it's just a yearly commitment. And so then you, well, that's, well, that's good. So, well, as long as you enjoy it, I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's nice to participate in serve. I, I always say if you don't, um, it's like being a voter, right? You, you if don't you don't vote, vote and, you, and you don't participate, you have no, you can't complain. Mm-hmm. And so I think if, uh, you know, you do your service and you participate, then uh, I, I think it's all good. So I think, you know, it's, it's exactly what you said. Once you get the knack of it and you know the lay of the land, then it becomes much easier. I remember President Obama saying that. You know, he said after eight years, you know, when they were getting ready to leave office, he goes, I'm just getting the hang of it now. <laughs> you know, it's like I know now what what I can filter out pretty easily. And, you know, you get the hang of it and, uh, you know, what you can do and what you can't in terms of uh, in, in terms of maneuvering things. And, and you get more comfortable in the role. But, um, yeah, so there you have it. But we haven't uh, the the uh, the. Uh, the the year i guess is is how i'm saying it i guess the year has been chugging along quite quite fast i i saw christmas things up everywhere and i i saw somebody shop, shop, shop online now. someone online put their christmas tree up because their kid wanted to and i thought well last year they we people had done it because they felt bad about the the event i don't know would you put your tree up already is no we're sticking we're, to we're, we're october we're sticking to tradition it goes up in december and it comes down after the new year and uh and that's that. But I did. I've seen all this news about how the supply chain is so still disrupted. Containers are here, ships are there. There's like something like forty some ships off the coast of California. There's a bunch off the coast of New York. Two of the biggest ports in the country have to offload. And when you look at these container ships, right, right with all the, you're like, wow, how long is that going to take? Because each container goes on a truck, right, <laughs> or a rail bed. Um, so. There's the panic buying now. If you want your Christmas stuff now, you better get out there and get it. You know, so fear, 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 fear. Yeah, home goods and all those places with all the nicky nacky ticky tacky they don't have it in yet. It's not in. Can't get it. Friends of mine, I don't know, John, I was going to ask you about this. We have a good friend, you know him too, Bruce, who got his truck driver's license because there's a truck driver shortage. Huge shortage. I was wondering about this myself. Do you guys have a, what is it called, the C... There's a there's a classification for a commercial truck driver, right? I, I think it's the, Class C. Class C, yeah. Would you go get your truck driver's license? I cannot. Would you even... drive one of the big rigs? I know you wanted a ride back in Sirius when all the truckers used to listen to us. We were convinced we were going to plan it where we were going to have a big rig come and pick you up in front of the uh, uh, in front uh, of radio yeah. Radio City Music Hall and take you for a loop around mm, the block in Manhattan, which would have been. You know, I I, I I got to tell you, I've been looking at that trucking thing int- with with intrigue because uh we do know many people from our serious days who who made their living doing long haul trucking sometimes they own their own uh their uh, own their ring sometimes they work for a company um but what stops me from doing it is my inability to con- my continued inability to be able to parallel park perfectly and i think that parallel parking is an ana- an analogy to driving a big truck you not you need to know how to manipulate that that why can't vehicle, you park right? You know, I did Aaron's technique. Our friend Aaron McHugh taught us a technique where as, you par- as you're as you parallel parking, you, you go back and back and back, and the minute you go back by the rear view mirror of the car that you're going to be in back of, you turn the wheel in the direction really hard in the direction you want to park in, if it's left or right, and then you keep going, and then when you get to the rear of the car, you turn the thing, and it, it, it's work. It, you have to trust the technique, and it works, but I'm just, Bob's much better at it than I am, and I think you tried to teach me. You gave up in frustration. Doesn't your doesn't your all-road have automatic parking? Yours, uh, yes, it does, and let me tell you. So, did you, I've so why not, don't you do hit the button? Have you ever tried it yourself? I was petrified. I thought yeah. I was going to slam into something, which you and I both did, Yeah. We, but we, we were in with the Volkswagen training So it was person, okay. Yeah. And... <laughs> She hit the button, but we were okay because if we hit something, it was on her. But I tried it once, and I thought I was inches away from slamming into something. And I, you're just supposed to touch, you know, trust the technology. But I've seen a lot of these things go awry, so I don't trust it. But uh, I have terrible time. I'm a good parker, I think. 
and uh, having lived in cities all most of my life and uh, driving all types of vehicles. Although I will say this VW Tiguan I have now is the most difficult car I've ever driven to try to park. From I a, cannot, for the life of me. Is it your sense so of the dimension spots. or something? Oh, the you blind know, it's spots. it's got a lot of okay. blind spots in the yeah. back, and I can't get the darn thing. Uh, thank God it's got beep, you know, the sensors on it, because I cannot gauge to get this thing parked properly, and it, it drives me crazy. And Richard, everybody is like, I can't believe you can't park this. I said, this is the worst car I've ever had. <laughs> I usually can wheel the thing yeah. right in, You're and it very aggravates good at it. me. I'm embarrassed. You're I'm very good at it. Quite frankly. Because Actually, I, I can should. parallel park the Beetle pretty well, but that's a small car. <laughs> that that's the kind of car you can certainly parallel park well. And just as a quick uh, quick note, program note for listeners, uh, Tim and I were at Comic Con this past weekend. We got some great interviews from comic book writers, artists, and illustrators who are all allies or members of the LGBTQ community. That's going to be a special we're airing at the end of the month, uh, right near Halloween, and it also includes some of the uh, stars from RuPaul's Drag Race. Jackie Cox is one of them, so stay tuned for that. Right. And uh, so in the first half of our show here, we've got what caught my eye and we'll do our uh, deep discount read. And then we'll take a break and do shop talk, our business birthday. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, we'll take a break, do our business birthday and then shop talk. And uh, and uh, hello to our friends out in uh, in Palm Springs. I was talking to somebody this weekend and I told them we were simulcast out there or that our, our shows out there where I threatened that maybe we would come out and do the show there in January when it's cold out east. You and I have been threatening for many a year. On that right. one, right? Yeah. You still need to do that. So uh, hello to our friends out there. So without further ado, Mr. Nash, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Another found treasure caught my eye. Many, many months ago, I did one about a couple in England who uh, inherited some guy's garage, and they found a bag of Star Wars toys, action figures, that were <laughs> worth like half a million dollars. This time around, it's a plate that was found at an old estate, and... Um, so this thing, it's a, it, the headline reads, Rare 16th Century Italian Dish covered in a drawer, Discovered in a Drawer Sells for $1.7 million. Get that, $1.7 million. An incredibly rare 16th century dish depicting the biblical tale of Samson and Delilah, which was discovered tucked away in a drawer, has sold at auction for more than $1.7 million, 10 times its original estimate. Woof. Um, the plate, which measures 27 inch centimeters, 11 inches in diameter, is believed to have been painted by Nicola da Urbino around 1520 to 23. Um, now this is, it's called, uh, I might mispronounce this, but it's a Maolica. It's a tin glazed Italian earthenware originally expected to fetch between 80,000 and 120,000 pounds, about 109,000 to 163,000, but then ended up selling for a record breaking 1.721 million, uh, last Wednesday at auction. Now, the artifact was found along with 400 other items that had been destined to be the, uh, on the auction block as part of the contents of a, a place called Lowood House, a grand country house situated in the Scottish borders. Pictures, furniture, books, silver, and works of art were all featured in the event run by British auctioneers Lionel and Turnbull. Um, when they saw this, the appraisers knew immediately they were looking at something really, really cool because this particular method of glazing where they this the tin on earthenware is is hard to find and uh they recognized the artist immediately and they were like wow okay so that's the trash to treasure thing right so it's when i was where my liberal arts education failed me that had gone right in the garbage if i saw that what about you well you know of course not i don't know what's on the back of it there might have been a glaze mark or something but I have to sort of agree with Tim. I'd be like, is that one of those? Uh, what's the company that used to sell all this stuff? Franklin <laughs> Mint. Capitamonte. Or Monte, Frank Capitan Frank Monte, Franklin Mint. So you have to know. Your cookies on it. Put a plan on it. <laughs> you, have, you have to know what you're looking at, basically. Yeah. So that was what caught my eye. A plate from a drawer that fetched 10 times what was it was expected to at auction. And now the uh, from that Lowood house, $1.72 million. I mean, I want to find a plate like that. Our lives would be just simple, right? You sell did the you plate. Say, did you, yeah. Do you have anything like that hanging around? Nope. You, you know, I have to say, I, I don't know if I said this to you. I, you know, I watched virtually zero TV in the 80s and 90s. I never watched television at all. And then into the 2000s, I watched very little TV. But I've gotten into Frasier. Yeah, I love Frasier. Have you ever watched, have you ever watched that I used show? to watch Frasier, yeah. It's a very amusing show, isn't it? 
So I watched the one where they went to the Antiques Roadshow. Did you ever see that one? And he brought no. the bear clock. That's yeah, you, you have to if you can find it. I laughed my butt off because I, I thought it, it was so much. <laughs> exactly what you expect, right? Like our humor. Like the father finds this art, you know, and Fraser and Niles are like, "Oh, really, Dad?" It ends up being some Russian artifact thing worth, you know, all you know, un- pennies. It, 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 no, it's it's priceless. Like they can't believe it was stolen from the czars, and now they think they're related to Russian royalty and. It's uh, it's really quite a quite a fun thing. But the father calls it a game show. Well, I'm watching my game show tonight. People bring in their cheap crap. And uh, so, yeah, but I, I um, yeah, no, I wish uh, I wish we would find something yeah. in a drawer. I, I know it's in my drawer. So I'm not finding these uh, plates from 1523. So I just can tell you that. Yeah. So my um, my caught my eye. I uh, I should do this. And I think you're probably better at this than I am. But the headline and what we teased the show with was nine photos you should always have on your phone. And I kind of agreed with some of these. Some of them, I guess I didn't think of. So I'll run through them pretty quick. <clears throat> the first one is a new one. And actually, John mentioned we went to Comic-Con. I had this. But it's your uh, your COVID vaccination card. Now, don't ding us, Mumbai. Because I mentioned this. I mean, this is a news story. We're not advertising. We're not taking advantage of the big event. Um, so they said you should have your COVID vaccination card. Take a picture of it and have that on your phone. Do you have yours photographed? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I also have an electronic pass like we talked about when we were at Comic-Con. Yeah, but I have the right. photo. You have, you have it there. Mm-hmm. You're, uh, I don't have this. Your driver's license. Excellent idea. Excellent idea. Do you have that? No. You're, you're photographed? No. So you should have your driver's license photographed and uh, or any other form or main form of your ID. ID. Excellent idea. And they said particularly if you're traveling overseas, so also your passport. Mm-hmm. Good idea. And so a lot of times they used to tell you to make another copy, a paper copy of your passport uh, when you traveled overseas, but they said you should also make one and put it on your phone, which is smart. And you get password protected under your notes app or yep. uh, if you have an Android phone, you can password protect it under a under an area there as well. They also said the VIN number of your car. That's a good one. That's a good one. That's hard to find sometimes. So if you just photograph the windshield, you're done, right? Right. And because the actually, I think your car is, I think there's 13 places on your car where the VIN number is in case it got, got stolen, stolen and yeah. uh, they need to find it. They also said your car's license plate, which is a smart one. Because I don't remember, I don't know my car's license plate number by heart. Do you? I don't know it by heart, but I do have it in my uh, notes app along with the yep. car information, yeah. Your auto insurance card, which mm-hmm. makes sense. Yep. Take a picture of that. Your medical ID and your dental insurance cards. Mm, I don't have dental okay. insurance, but yeah. so your medical ID card, which makes sense. They said a, uh, a rental, the pictures of if you are traveling somewhere, take a picture of the rental car before and after oh, you yeah. turn it in. Yeah. I've never done that, but they said to do that to make sure you don't get uh, dinged in case quote unquote, the car got dinged. And also your Airbnb or other rental property, if you went to a vacation rental by owner or something, take a picture of what the Airbnb looked like before and after and make sure you take a selfie Mm -hmm. of yourself Mm -hmm. in front of the place to prove that you were there and how you left the rooms or how you left the place when you left. They said be sure to take a selfie standing in front of the rental property and uh, so that it's geotagged to prove that you were there or that you left and um showing the address so i uh so i thought that was just good advice to have particularly i thought uh, on some of the id stuff i um, agree totally agree smart so yeah so uh so there you go we'll post that on our on our facebook page which is focus group radio hey many of you know that uh, our friends at deep discount uh support us here on focus group radio and uh, be sure to head over to focusgroupradio.com and click on the deep discount logo as john mentioned they're having a halloween sale right now and uh so if you head over there you'll be able to find all kinds of great spooky scary movies john what did you pick this week you know i am such a fan of this this old movie and i say old because it it's features george c scott it's called the changeling john russell played by george c scott whose family was recently killed in a road accident retires to a lonely mansion and experiences supernatural occurrences that seem to be linked to the house's past he has a seance conducted and discovers that the house is troubled by a crippled boy who was murdered in the attic. 1980, 115 minutes, and I believe Deep Discount has it, the DVD, for 634. Take a flyer on it. I think you'll like it. It's psychological terror and thriller. There's, and I like the psychological things. I think you do too, Tim. <laughs> Which I love, though. Yeah. I do. 
do love those. I picked, I, um, I struggled with this genre because a lot of what I pick is the same thing over and over again. You know, yeah. I always pick the yeah. shining or something else. So I did something different. I went because my lucky number 17, I went to the 17th page on the sale and I picked a movie on there. And the one I picked was the thing from another world <laughs> on DVD. You could be describing anybody in Washington, but anyway, <laughs> and then it's uh, members of an Antarctic research team are killed off by a frozen alien. They uncover, uh, this is a classic sci-fi horror popcorn and soda pop movie from 1951. And, uh, I went and then I looked at, um, I went and, and tried to pull up some clips of it. And uh, it just seems wonderful. It actually has rave reviews. And they said it came from a time when people were very optimistic. And they said that what people love about the movie is that there's a whole, there, there's no criticism uh, about the actors and about what's going on, that there's very much an optimism about it, American optimism and a can-do spirit in this movie. And uh, have you ever watched it? No, no. And and whenever you pick, I love the story behind this selection. So this is definitely going to be on my list now. Excellent choice. All right. And the uh, the release this week is a movie I've been dying to see, actually. It's called Free Guy. It stars one of my favorite actors, Ryan Reynolds. I think he's a very funny guy. And uh, I'm going to read a description of the movie to you. Um, affable big town bank teller guy, Ryan Reynolds, was content with life and job, the daily violent holdups notwithstanding. However, his fateful encounter with one foxy felon, Jordy, Jody Comer, brought him the realization that he was actually a background character in an open-world video game, and while his newfound autonomy makes him a hit with players, it also draws the wrath of the program's developer. So he's basically in a video game. He realize, he becomes self-aware that he's a character in a video game, and he decides to change the game. It got good reviews. It, it came out last year. Unfortunately, it went directly to one of the streaming services because of the event. So this is something you pick up on Blu-ray for twenty four ninety nine. Highly recommend that we try it out. So that's what I'm going to do. So recapping, it's the Halloween sale here at Deep Discount. And uh, Halloween means scary, spooky movies. As Tim said, I picked one called The Changeling. It's one I've sele- suggested in the past because it's one of these psychological thrillers that I love with George C. Scott. Tim picked The Thing from Another World, which supposedly, besides the monster, reflects uh, <laughs> American optimism. And then we have as the release of this week, Free Guy, from uh, and starring Ryan Reynolds, by the way. So uh, go to focusgroupradio.com, click on the Deep Discount logo when you get there, and start going down the rabbit hole and shopping away. We are going to take a very small break here. When we come back, we have business birthday, and we also have uh, one or two shop talks we're going to tackle. So stay with us, and we'll be right back. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now, back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the focus group. Tim Bennett here with Mr. John Nash. The second part of our show here. We've got a business birthday, and then we'll do a couple of shop talks. So uh, thanks for joining us. Be sure to follow along with us during the week on our social media, which is all branded Focus Group Radio at Facebook and uh, also our website, which is focusgroupradio.com. You'll find our sponsors there and uh, be sure to support them because they support us. You'll also find all of our media house there from a long time ago. Right, John? <laughs> it goes back to, yeah, our media goes back in so much as I guess to 2016 when we uh, developed the YouTube and the podcast platform because everything else is kind of, uh, the Sirius XM world. We only have descriptions of the show, but that's that's what they had. You know, you too. Has have the leaves started changing where you are yet? Uh, upstate, yeah. We have actually a couple of our trees. They're down. The locust trees, in particular, they're the last to come in and the first to go in the fall. It's an interesting breed. Um, shag bark hickories. This year we have nuts. Anybody listening who has hickory nuts knows that when the trees do the nutting, it's a very different type of fall cleanup. It's like you get a shovel, basically. You got to. <laughs> The squirrels do their stuff, 
but there's a lot of nuts and a lot of shells on the lawn. The trees do their nutting. Is that an actual thing? Yeah, the nuts come out. It almost yeah. sounds, like, sounds like a line of poetry. When the trees do their nutting. Uh, it depends on who's the poet. It sounds lewd, too. <laughs> I, I, I got to write on, that down. Yeah. The trees <laughs> The trees are nutting. nutting. Yeah. <laughs> and we have a branch. I, I don't know if you've had this happen down there. After, we've had some pretty wicked storms go through with high winds. And the, a storm came through once. It lasted maybe five minutes, but the winds exceeded 60 miles an hour and they took down a couple of branches. And I went out and cleaned the branches up right away. But then a weeks later, we noticed that one branch from one of these hickory nut trees was drooping and it was pointing like it did. It, it was in a position we'd never seen it before. It's damaged. So clearly it got torqued in the wind or something. And now we have to, and it's too far up the tree to get at with a ladder and it's too heavy to do that yourself. You don't want to bring a limb down like that. So now we have to find a tree guy to come in. Cut. Where is the hickory tree at your house? The is one right the back? Th- there's two, there's several in the back. And then there's one right at the very front of the property. When you drive in the driveway, the very first tree you see is hickory. And then it goes uh, white pine, white pine, white pine. And the white pines are triple the size of the house. And every winter in an ice storm, when one of those branches come down, we're like, well, it's going to just go to the roof one day. So that's, your trees are really big too. Your pine trees are yeah. double, the high, double the height of your house. So they're beautiful. And I don't know, do you guys talk about like making sure the branches are sort of away from the house? Well, you know, the the tree Nazis here in Rome. You can't touch them without no. permission, right? Every- Everything's labeled and marked and, you know, there's a, there's a tree committee and a park shade tree committee and there's a arborist, a town arborist, and everything's laid, all, particularly the pine trees. So everything's, everything's marked. So you're not supposed to touch anything. It's crazy, quite frankly. Um, so I don't know, but we have one pine tree that's enormous. It's probably a couple hundred years old that's hanging over the house and everybody keeps telling us, ah, oh, tree's going to fall through the house. I said, I just hope. We're That's what we hear too. Does. We we someone a, a guy walked by that day. He's like, by the way, one of those trees is going to come down one day. It, they don't. But you know, whenever you do see a tree uprooted, um, we had a, a pretty bad storm upstate, and I went on a bike ride a couple days after the storm, and I went by an old old tree that I used to always see. It's gorgeous, big old. I think it might have been an oak tree. It was on its side, and the roots. You know, you know how we always suspect that they go really deep. They're not. Yeah. They're very shallow in many trees, so it can be toppled over. I'm like, I don't want to see that. But I think with yeah. the, I think with the white pines and your pines in particular, it's the branches that are a problem. I don't think the whole tree is going to come down, but you know, the branch could come down and cause a problem. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. I don't know. I mean, if it comes through the house, I, you'd have to buy a new house, or you'd have to build a new house, I think, because the tree is that big. Well, and you know, it, it weighs that. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you'd have to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why Bob has got his eye on the trees. And I'm like, I like those trees. Well, you know, but by the way, removal of a tree is not a simple matter. It's it's a couple thousand bucks to get rid of a, a big tree. Yeah, somebody said the insurance company, if they came, if your insurance company came and looked at it, they might remove it because so they don't have the claim to have to build you a house. Mm. Interesting. That's an interesting one. You might one. want to consider okay. that. All right. Did you get a new refrigerator, by the way? We did. It finally arrived. It arrived. We're thrilled. And it's the same dimensions as the old one. But when you open it, it just seems bigger and roomier. And and when they took the old one away, because it was 22 year olds, the guys picked it up like, wow, this thing weighs a ton. It's true. The new stuff, because of the way they manufacture it now, is much lighter. And the old one was a real cantankerous thing. But it was, yeah, we got it. We're happy. Bob's ice maker is working good. We're all set. Did you get it through Sears or where'd you get it from? We went through Lowe's and uh, it was oh. about a month long wait. Oh, that's good. Okay. All right. So uh, we've got our business birthday today. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the focus group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So today, October 13th, we actually had trouble finding a business birthday today. So there was there was um, there was a business birthday from some guy that he was a, a crook, <laughs> essentially, and I couldn't quite make heads or tails of what he did, <laughs> other than they kept saying he was a business person. Oh, Charles he contributed Wiley. to society. He's a crook, <laughs> right? Charles Wiley, and he was he was ended up in just some fraudster that he would start these companies and then end up in he ended up in prison and bankrupt. So I didn't want to highlight him, and then. There was the guy who developed the Klieg lights. Oh my God. German. Oh my God. Are you serious? That those big, okay. And the, you know, the his Kliegs. last name was Klieg. Klieg. He was yeah. German. But that's about all it said about him. 
spelled Klieg Light, and that would have been the Brizzle's birthday, and on to the next thing. So I didn't do him either. So Who would you settle on? So I settled on Ralph Lifshitz, who is uh, Ralph Lauren. Who is? Uh, but he was born October fourteenth, so it's really Thursday. So okay, there was nobody okay. for October thirteenth. Surprisingly, there's got to be somebody. Well, but I'll you, tell you mentioned what, John, the Klieg like guy. You, you nailed the thirteenth with Klieg, and there's someone. I, yeah. yeah, there just was no information about him, though. You know, even though it's such a, a ubiquitous thing, the Klieg light. But there was that. That was about it. That's mm-hmm. all. They had the name, the light named after him, big light spotlight. So anyway, Ralph Lifshitz, who changed his name to Ralph Lauren, which I think was probably smart. Um, for his brand, clothing brand, born October 14th, 1939, is 82 on uh, this Thursday. American fashion designer, philanthropist, and billionaire businessman, global multi-billion dollar enterprise. Now, a lot of people, me included, a lot of people mispronounce the name and call him Ralph Lauren, I think trying to make it fancy. Lauren, right? It's Ralph Lauren, like the girl's name Lauren, Lauren, right? But I don't know why everybody says, and I still sometimes... Does Lorraine sound myself. more French or something? Lorraine, Ralph Lorraine. <laughs> it's like people would say Henri Bendel in New yeah. York City. It's, it's Henry Bendel. Henry Bendel, yeah. It's Bendels. Yeah. Um, my grandfather used to work for the Bendels. It's, he's, there's not a French thing in there. It's Henry Bendel. It's not Henri Bendel. So um, you know, I guess we could have been Timothée Timothe Benet, or Benet, and you could have been, uh, you could have been uh, Jean Jean. That's about Jean the Nash. most. Jean, I don't know how. I don't know what you can do with John Nash. Jean Thomas. Jean, Jean Thomas, Thomas Nash. Nash. <laughs> you can't Nash. escape. You can't escape that one. You just Nash. can't escape. Yeah. Nash. So um, he was well known for his. He's also well known for his collection of rare automobiles. I wonder if he had a Subaru. Some of which have been displayed in museum exhibits. Uh, he stepped down from the company in 2015, but he remains executive chairman and chief creative officer. His estimated wealth. Do you want to guess what his estimated wealth is? I'm going to put him at uh, 1.5 to 2 billion. 6.3 billion. Wow. Talk about being off. Six, wow. Okay. Well, hey, look, global brand. The, and it's been uh, chugging along for years successfully. So, yeah. Right. 102nd richest person in America, which I thought 6.3 billion. I guess there's a lot of Campbell Soup and Mars candy bars and people ahead of him. <laughs> But uh, 102nd <laughs> yeah. richest person, you know, some of these IB, uh, you know, Amazon people and stuff, Apple. Uh, born in the Bronx, grew up in the same neighborhood as Calvin Klein. Two designer wow, okay. kids. okay. Interesting. Two, in a Jewish neighborhood. Uh, parents were immigrants from Belarus, mm, which okay. I thought was interesting. You know, Belarus was in the news earlier in the year because of crackdowns. Went to the City University of New York. He studied business, dropped out after two years. That's the key to success john we didn't drop out of college we've heard this over and over and over steve jobs dropped out of college ralph lauren dropped, dropped out, out of college, college. <laughs> ray Kroc dropped out of college. college you gotta drop out of college you want to get anywhere ray Kroc, founder yeah. of mcdonald's right yeah didn't didn't gates drop out of college uh-huh. yeah you name it they dropped out of college um from 62 to 64 he served in the army then he had a brief stint at brooks brothers when he got out of the army he worked as a sales assistant before he became a salesperson at a tie company. And uh, so he started his own tie company, he called it uh, Ralph Lauren Corporation, 1967. He sold men's ties. He was 28 years old. And he worked for this tie manufacturer called Bo Brummel. And he convinced the company's president to let him start his own little tie line. Bo Brummel. Do and, you remember um, Bo Brummel by any chance? I don't remember it. I'm, you know, I've heard the name. name only yeah. because I don't remember the product, but, but I do know the name, and I bet it's because of this, right? Right. Well, didn't uh, when it was also uh, I, I think he was a uh, Bo Brummel was a dandy from the 1800s, wasn't it? <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> I think it, they, 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 yeah. And I and I remember the Billy Joel song. You could be a real Bo Brummel baby if you just give me that. Yeah. Anyway, he uh, convinced the president at the time to let him start his own line. So uh, he um, he had his own little drawer at the time uh, at the company where he sold out of. So he had um, because of his interest in sports, he named. His first line of menswear polo in 1968, he worked out of a single drawer in the showroom of the Empire State Building, and he would make all the deliveries himself, um, and he had convinced the Manhattan department store of Bloomingdale's to sell his line exclusively, and I didn't realize this, but Bloomingdale's had given him the very first designer in-store boutique, so uh, Ralph was, uh, Bloomingdale's um, had Ralph be the very first designer that they ever gave at their own little in-store boutique. So before then, they didn't have anything but their own brand stuff. 
So I thought that was interesting. It was a first for talk, uh, you talk about a, a a business break that is just fantastic. You, you imagine you, Bloomingdale's, yeah, right? Yeah. But what you, Bloomingdale's was like the the icon, right, of Manhattan. Yeah, and, and everybody that, copied Saks what they and, did. So if he had his little in store boutique, others are going to start thinking we should have designers. Wow, pretty cool. Now I didn't know this. He had. Um, I thought the polo shirt came first. Like I thought, so he did the ties. So, but it, it, but he actually did women's stuff first. So it said 1971, he launched a line of tailored shirts for women, which had the polo player emblem, which everybody knows about, uh, appeared on the shirt's cuff. And uh, so he launched, um, the following year, he launched a standalone store, which again was the very first time an American designer had a standalone store. He launched in Beverly Hills. And then it wasn't until '72 when he launched the various he launched the polo shirt, which uh, which men had um, men had worn, and it became kind of the preppy look. This was '72. The tagline was, "Every team has its own color. We have 17." So everybody remembers the that was when he was competing with Lacoste. Remember? Mm-hmm. Yep. So he outfitted the Great Gatsby in 1974, the movie uh, with said, um, Diane, yeah, with Robert Redford. Robert Redford, all the clothes. Right. All the clothes came from uh, from him. Diane Keaton and Woody Allen wore all his clothes in the uh, movie Annie Hall. And uh, that was another big break for him. He also launched a line of fragrances. We, who Remember the polo, green bottle, the, sure. the cologne okay. in the How 80s? How could you forget that? Yeah. So they were launched at Bloomingdale's in 78. It's He was also the very first designer to launch a men's and women's fragrance at the same time. It was the very first time a designer did that simultaneously. He also was the very first American designer to have a freestanding uh, store outside of the U.S. He opened on Bond Street, uh, New Bond Street in London. He opened the store and then he opened his flagship in New York City and then introduced a number of other lines. Went public in 97. Open restaurants. I've never eaten in an RL restaurant. Have you? No, no. Didn't even know we had them, but good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, had a, uh, appeared on magazine covers, of course, dot, dot, dot. If you've ever watched, if you go to YouTube, you can watch, he had a 50th anniversary. It's about a half hour long. There's a 50th anniversary, somewhat fashion show, a retrospective of his clothes. It's really pretty cool to watch. And it's cool to watch who's sitting there. So it's in Grand Central, kind of the hallway of Grand Central Station, train station, mm-hmm. I think it is. Yeah, what a great space. And all these models are coming down. The music's fantastic. And it's the clothing from the beginning to now. And it's for the 50th anniversary. This was done in September 2018. And you name it, they're there. The, the glitterati of, of celebrity is there. And then New York um, High Society is all sitting in the audience there, kind of in these in the catacombs of the Grand Central Station. And this fashion show goes on with the great music and models. I mean, it's really quite quite breathtaking. That's the picture I'm showing you if you're watching on the video. I was wondering where that out. was from. That that so that's from so you go to YouTube, uh, you can search for Ralph Lauren fifty you said fiftieth anniversary? Yeah, just say fiftieth anniversary, anniversary celebration or show. About and a half hour. It's like twenty minutes long, maybe eighteen, twenty minutes long, whatever, but it's magnificent. Any of his shows, if you like that sort of thing, are pretty cool to watch because they're really events. Well done. Well done. Yeah, and they're done done pretty cool. He um and then talks about his kids. There was one kid married uh George Bush's uh granddaughter, hmm. um, Lauren. Um Lauren Bush, just somewhat ironic. And as uh, one daughter has a candy store, Dylan's Candy Bar, yep. which is in New York. Well known. He has a ranch, John, a seventeen thousand acre cattle ranch in Ridgeway, Colorado. Mm. We we drove right by it, I believe, on our way to uh, one of our clients a while ago. Wonder if he's got any. Wonder if he's got any stuff there. Oh, my guess, Tim, is that he shops at a store that would be a little more consistent. <laughs> right. I think. Yeah, I think he's also given millions and millions and millions of dollars. He's very, very philanthropic. Uh, lots of money to cancer research uh, in New York, as well as uh, uh, other parts of the U.S., uh, particularly New York City, Washington, D.C., other parts of the U.S., uh, Sloan Kettering, um, and then Europe. He's, he's also giving a lot of money to Europe for uh, for cancer research and supporting underserved and uh in needed communities for cancer research. Also, a lot of historic stuff, Smithsonian Institute, and um, and also the uh, Fallen Heroes um, Fund. So he's really given um, as much as he's he's had success. He's also been very very um, 
charitable, which mm-hmm. is uh, which is good to hear. And then, you know, he I don't know if you remember, but he's also given um, lots of stuff to, or he's he also designed the Olympic outfits, That's the correct. Olympic uniforms. Yeah. Because they were such a mess in 2008. But now this year, apparently, did you watch the Olympics this year and see we the did. outfits? Yeah, I wasn't uh, wasn't too taken with the outfits. But... Well, everybody criticized them this year with the outfits. So they don't know. They, people are saying now they want a new designer because they think the outfits are too much. They said the outfits look too much like people were going to go for a weekend in Newport rather than going to the Olympics. Mm, okay. I don't know if I agree with that. So happy birthday, Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Big birthday. And uh, one thing I just want to return to briefly is you are correct about those big, big, big fashion show staged production videos. Like Pat sometimes turns me on to some from that come out of Paris, like it might have been Yves Saint Laurent or Christian Dior. And they spend an, a huge amount of money. And they're sometimes they're really incredibly, it's like watching a movie, frankly, right? Yeah, they're incredible. Yeah. Hermes, well Hermes does some fantastic things. Too. Imaginative, colorful, interesting yep. spaces. They do it in Grand Central is an amazing space to do this in. So yeah, great, great recommendation there. And happy birthday to Ralph. Yeah, the uh, so our shop talk uh, this week. John found uh, found this story. It um, we got a couple of quick ones. This one is this is how your brain tricks you into thinking that you don't have time for important stuff. We've done stories similar to this before, but um, we always think it's good to revisit. Th- them sometimes and john's better at this than i am in terms of being able to um carp- carp- compartmentalize <laughs> yeah his uh his day in terms of looking at uh, or responding to emails and so forth and they said we sometimes the urgency trumps importance uh every time and so sometimes i try to if an email comes in to answer it right away but they said that you really need to delegate and decide whether what's important and when to answer things at certain times. And they had something called the Eisenhower matrix. And uh, I laughed at it a little bit because I thought it really does kind of mimic how you handle things, right? Do you want to want to read the four categories of this Eisenhower matrix? Yeah. So what, what Tim is driving at is uh, something called the Eisenhower matrix is designed to help you beat the urgency effect. And the urgency effect is a text. It's an email. It's things that are you think are easy to take care of and you do it right away. But frankly, you're just pushing off the more important work. And these are things that really aren't that easy. So the uh, Eisenhower matrix is basically like taking a piece of paper and drawing a square, you know, like a, a plus sign. And so it breaks into four quadrants. Upper left quadrant is important, urgent. And then the right one is important, not urgent. And the bottom left quadrant is not important but urgent. And the bottom right is not important and not urgent. So, for example, in the urgent and important thing uh, quadrant, they put things like things with clear deadlines and consequences for not taking immediate action. This is pretty straightforward. You have a presentation due. you You have a pitch on a certain time and a certain day. You're driving towards that goal. And examples of finishing a client project, submitting a draft article, uh, responding to some email or picking up your kid from school, which is urgent and important. <laughs> so on the urgent, important, but not urgent activities without set deadline, uh, d- deadlines are one thing. Examples are strategic planning, professional development, development, networking, and exercise. I put exercise in important and urgent personally. That's me. Um, and not important and urgent. You would say something you can delegate you know, things that you can pass off your desk, uploading blog posts, scheduling stuff, responding to some emails and meal prep they put down there. Like, I don't know why they put that in there. And then not important and not urgent would be things like social media, watching TV, video games, and eating junk food. This all makes sense, right? So if you sat down and you did that Eisenhower matrix, and I wonder if it was named after General Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who knows? you would be able to start sequestering your tasks into things that you thought were, you might've thought were urgent, but when you put them in their quadrants, you're like, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to pay attention to that for a while. I'll get this other thing done. And then they said in the article that, uh, then we've, Tim and I have covered this from other uh, productivity and time management points of view. Set aside your most productive two to four hours each day for your most important work. And for some of us, that's the morning. And for some of us, that's the afternoon. I mean, it depends on if you're a morning person or a night person. I I get some great work done after seven at night, or sometimes I do my best thinking on a bike ride. So hard to, you know, decide where you're going to do that. But you're a night, you're a night worker though. I'm trying to shift and you can, you can. Yeah. I was, you know, I was talking to our producer, Matt the other day, and, uh, he's also trying to move his clock, trying to get up earlier. (laughs) 
And we were doing a Zoom call, and he's like, man, it's killing me. It's killing me. Resetting my clock is killing me. It takes time. And uh, But, yeah, I tend to do a lot of good thinking at night. And um, But I'm trying to get into bed earlier, get up earlier, and, uh, you know, and it helps. So, uh, and then the other thing they said here is only check your communication apps at certain times of the day. And I know people who are extremely disciplined with this, where they will only answer email from two to four or from three to five and everything else you just wait. And you know, before we had email, we had phones and sometimes you didn't reach somebody and things got done anyway. So, you know, right. Right. You got the pink slip and then you collect them while you were out. Right. Right. Or then, you know, usually at the end of the day, you'd say, okay, let me call all these people back. Yeah, exactly. And then you, you would do it at four o'clock or four thirty, and call everybody back, unless it was something that was, you know, you were waiting for a call and it was dire that you know you had to get. And, and back let's to be something. let's be perfectly honest too. Sometimes a phone call is way faster than typing up an email. Hey, how you doing? Did you get this? You, okay, I got that. Sure thing. Thanks. Talk to you later. Boom. Now, well, you get more done because yeah. you're not back and forth, back and forth. I yeah. know you're exactly right. You're exactly right. So, and then the yeah, last so, thing they gave us was give your important tasks a deadline. You know, so if you have an internal task that you want done, you're going to take everything out of your office, clean it, and put it all back in and throw some books away or something. Actually put a time factor on that and say, I want that done by Thursday. And, and trust me, when you do that, when you actually put that down, like every Sunday I write down the major list and the list of what I call idiot stuff. The idiot stuff is things like mailing something, going to the post office, you know, things that you do, tasks, right? Little chores and stuff. So, so what time on Sunday would you do that? Oh, I do it at do about do it in the uh, morning. Six o'clock. No, no, six, six, seven at night before I go to sleep, or before I, right before I go to bed, I'll do that, and it just gets it out of my head, and I'm free and clear. And I have the two. The next morning, I wake up. I'm like, okay, I'm going to start the short list and the long list, and then I actually block out time in my calendar program. The minute you see these blocks chew up your week, you're like, wow, we have very little time. <laughs> and then, and then if, the, and then if you don't get something done on the day, do you move it immediately yep. to the next day, or do you? And does does it become the task, the first task that day, or does it um, fall somewhere else? Um, that's it, where I, because I keep end up put, I end up pushing, 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 and. It may fall somewhere else, um, but I try to, I really do make an effort to get the, I, to limit the number of things I can get done to a reasonable amount so I don't have to move tasks. That's the real solution is how much time do you really have? Get what you really want done, done, and then you don't have to start doing the moving the list thing. Hmm. All right, folks, uh, we're going to wrap up there. Um, so that article was uh, all about the urgency effect and um, how your brain tricks you into not getting the important stuff done. And we gave you some thoughts on how to circumvent that with the Eisenhower Matrix. Uh, Focusgroupradio.com is our URL. Check us out there, including all of our media. And we want to thank Deep Discount for being a partner of ours here today. And thank you for joining us. See you next week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group. 